Good afternoon. It is a great honor to uh, welcome Professor Wendy Silver back to the University of Michigan. She was here only a year ago giving a talk, but it's a different talk. So uh, I think you'll find it riveting. Uh, Wendy is one of our first invited speakers for the nascent Institute for Global Change Biology. Uh, the Institute hasn't been populated with a director or any scientists yet, but we hope to have uh, professors in multiple departments, including EEB, when the Institute is finally formulated. Wendy is a global change ecologist, a biogeochemist. Um, she's a valued colleague and friend who I've known since uh, well, since BU, I think, but maybe even before then. So she got her PhD at Yale in 1992. Oh, it, this is a co, it's sponsored by EEB as well as the Institute for uh, Global Change Biology. I'm, I'm gonna make that point because Deerman will kill me if I don't. Um, so, um, no, it's this, is, this is, we are an institution with porous boundaries. So um, that's what the, Institute for Global Change Biology is about. So, um, Wendy got her PhD at Yale in 92. She was a DOE Distinguished Postdoc in Global Change from 92 to 93. I first really worked and met with her when she was at um, BU, 95, Boston University in 95, 97. I was in Woods Hole. We both worked at the Harvard Forest LTER, and I had the pleasure of co-mentoring an undergraduate student with Wendy, and we published a paper, believe it or not. And, and so I'm a co-author of Wendy's as well. Um, she has been a professor at UC Berkeley since 98. She's currently the Rudy Gras chair, chair and professor of ecosystem ecology and biogeochemistry in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management at UC Berkeley. Her work focuses on biogeochemical effects uh, of climate change and human impacts on the environment and the potential for mitigating these effects. She's a lead scientist of the Marin County Carbon Project, which is determining potential land use, land-based climate change mitigation, particularly by composting high emission organic waste. Um, she's a fellow of the Ecological Society of America. Uh, my most recent collaboration with Wendy and is um, at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. She's a key player in an LTER soil organic matter project that involves many of us. And I could talk all day, but I want Wendy to have a chance to talk. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wendy Silver to the University of Michigan. Thanks, Newt. Can you guys hear me? Is that being projected? OK, great. Um, I, I want to thank Newt and Catherine for inviting me. It's exciting to be back. Um, and as Newt said, I, I consider myself a global change ecologist or biologist, um, and I work in biogeochemistry. And for the majority of my career, I focused on what m most biogeochemists who work in the climate change realm focus on, which is describing the problem um, and measuring, particularly measuring fluxes and drivers of fluxes of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And a little over a decade ago, um, feeling overwhelmed in, in maybe many of the ways that many of you do about climate change and, and, and frustrated that, um, that I was just talking in, about the problem and being depressed about it, I started to look at um, the science behind some solutions. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk in particular about the long-term climate change mit mitigation potential of working lands. So to start off, see if this works. Okay, there it goes. I want to make sure that we're all um, coming from the, the same frame of reference with regard to climate change. This, um, this slide is of a recent report that came out last year called the IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if you're like me, um, the, the target that, that I had focused on for many years of limiting global warming was two degrees Celsius, right? We were trying to keep warming to a maximum of two degrees Celsius above what the long-term baseline was. But this report came out last year about what some of the consequences would be of 1.5 degrees C warming, so half a degree less than what our previous target would be. And I, I'd just like to read the quote. 
Without increased and urgent mitigation ambition in the coming years, leading to a sharp decline in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, 2030, that's about a decade from now, global warming will surpa surpass 1.5 degrees Celsius in the following decades, leading to irreversible loss of the most fragile ecosystems and crisis after crisis for the most vulnerable people in society. And if you're thinking that you're not one of the most vulnerable people and, uh, or part of the most vulnerable societies, um, you're wrong. You're just wrong because there are many ways in which we will feel that impact even though we're not in, in uh, poor countries or living in poor regions. Um, I think those people will definitely be hit the hardest, but the economic, social, political um, issues that are already arising because of climate change driven changes in our, in our um, ecosystems is, is something that is going to impact all of us and it already is impacting all of us. Um, to kind of further illustrate that, this is a uh, map that came out of that analysis where they used um, 19 different um, global vegetation models that are sensitive to climate and determine where you would likely see um, severe, uh, moderate to severe ecosystem transformation, meaning biome shift, right? Whole biome shifts um, with uh, 1.5 to 2 degree, up to 2 degree uh, warming. The dark colors, the dark reds, are the places where we'd see dramatic shift even with 1.5 degrees Celsius. Anything with color, uh, represents a significant shift, meaning that greater than 50% of the models uh, showed biome level transformation, so shifting in, in, in the type of biome you have with 1.5 degrees um, to 2 degrees. And then anything that's gray is something that would shift after, at or after 2 degrees Celsius. Um, so pretty significant, just looking at the color on that map gives you an idea that there's uh, major transformations that are going on right now. The report goes on um, to say this, all pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with limited or no overshoot. Limited to no overshoot doesn't mean that the model's um, getting, getting the temperature lower. It's saying limited to no overshoot of going above 1.5 degrees C and then coming down. Right? So topping out at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, project the use of carbon dioxide removal on the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons of CO2 over the 21st century. And I always like to put units either in, you know, in both CO2 and carbon, and it becomes kind of clunky when I'm not teaching a class on biogeochemistry. But you'll see I'm, I'm trying to focus here on carbon units. They are different than CO2 units. They are equivalent. I've made those calculations for you. So 27 to about 270 gigatons of carbon, 10 to the 15th grams of carbon that needs to be removed from the atmosphere. This is not emissions reduction. This is not emissions reduction. That has to happen. That's an essential piece of all of this. This is in addition to emissions reduction. We have to remove CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. And just to illustrate that, I have a graph. So this is my hypothetical emissions scenario of a business as usual. So this is atmosp projected atmospheric CO2. This looks a lot like the Keeling curve from Mauna Loa, because basically what I did is I took a piece of the Keeling curve and I just projected it out into the future. So that's what that would look like. And this is a hypothetical aggressive, aggressive emissions reduction scenario, right? And what happens? CO2 continues to increase warming continues to increase. So what we need to do is bend the curve. We need to combine um, emissions reduction with carbon dioxide removal, and that's the only way that we'll be able to limit the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere to actually slow or even halt warming. So I stress this, and if I have a little edge to my voice and maybe sound a little angry, it's because many of my ecology colleagues don't like me talking about carbon dioxide removal. And their fear is, is that if we start as ecologists talking about carbon dioxide removal, the fossil fuel industry or 
the politicians will say, great, natural and working lands can remove carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. Let's continue to pollute. Let's continue to emit. And my argument is, as ecologists, we can no longer get away with that. We have to talk to people about the fact that, that emissions reduction is an essential piece and we can't slow down. And in addition now, because we didn't slow down earlier, we have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and we have to look at the broadest portfolio of approaches as we can because there is no uh, magic tool or silver bullet, no pun intended, um, that can solve this problem. So please communicate that um, as best you can. It's important. Okay, so my group uh, sat around the table uh, a little over a decade ago and said, well, can management of working lands contribute to climate change mitigation and CO2 removal? Is there anything that we can do with our skills that can contribute to solving this problem? And we looked at it from an ecosystem perspective because that's what our, our lens is, our frame. And when you do that, what you see is that there's about 760 um, gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere and about 610 gigatons of carbon in vegetation. These are rough numbers, but you know, they're pretty well agreed upon numbers. And that CO2 gets uh, pulled out of the atmosphere by plants via photosynthesis and stored there. Now, some of that CO2 from plants gets returned to the atmosphere when the plants die or they burn or whatever. Plants are by nature ephemeral. Uh, they don't live uh, generally longer than, than 100 years or in some cases of a few old trees, maybe a few hundred years. Some of the carbon that was in plants that got pulled out of the atmosphere ends up in the soil. Roots are really good at injecting carbon into the soil, and some of that carbon gets trapped in the soil, um, either in soil aggregates or gets shunted very deep into the soil where microbes don't have access to it, and so it gets stored. And so that carbon, that, that carbon um, contributes to an accumulation in the soil that can be quite large. Uh, we really don't know how much carbon is in soils globally. And Newt, would you agree with me on that? I would. So there are numbers all over the map um, on how much carbon is in soils. I picked a middle number, about 2,000 gigatons. I've seen 1,500, I've seen 3,500. And the problem is, if you think about it, it's a big brown box, right, where it's uh, diverse and we can't see into it, we can't reach into it all that easily. Um, so, and we, when we sample soil carbon, what we analyze on our carbon nitrogen analyzers is about this much at a time. It's in milligram range, right? So we're scaling up from milligrams to, to plots, to ecosystems, landscapes, regions, and the globe. Um, and as you can imagine, there are some problems with that. We do the best we can. We can definitely detect differences in soil carbon and changes in soil carbon, uh, but to estimate what the, the whole pool is, is, is quite difficult. Now, another point I want to make uh, from this slide is that, um, you know, carbon gets into the soil, but it doesn't stay there forever. Um, there's microbial respiration that helps return carbon from the soil to the atmosphere. And that microbial respiration is absolutely critical. If we didn't have microbes breaking down organic material and organic carbon in soils, we would be buried in our own waste, right? So they're playing a really, really important role. And by breaking down the organic matter, that's the vehicle for carbon. They're also releasing nutrients that help plants grow, help us live, and all those things. So the decomposition piece of this and the return by microbes is absolutely essential. Um, a lot of people get hung up when they think about soil carbon on how long carbon resides in soils. And they assume that a, 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 every molecule of carbon that goes in has to stay there for a very long time for it to play an important role in carbon sequestration and climate change mitigation. But that's not really the case. What you really have to do is just maintain more carbon going in than carbon going out. So as long as there's more carbon going into soils than going out, you're sequestering and you have a net benefit from the atmospheric perspective. So, you don't have to store carbon, any, any given molecule of carbon, for a very long time for it to be beneficial. Now, if we can, that's all the better, but that's not, necessar not necessary uh, to, to help mitigate climate change. Why would you want to store carbon in soils? Well, this is the beauty of um, this kind of an approach to climate change mitigation. Uh, 
farmers, you talk to any farmer and rancher, and they know that managing uh, soils for carbon sequestration by increasing the soil organic matter content, remember organic matter, organic things that have carbon in their tissues, that's the vehicle for getting carbon out of the atmosphere and, and into soils, um, has many, many co-benefits, right? I, I've yet to meet a farmer or a rancher um, or a gardener who didn't want to increase the organic matter content of their soils. And that's because organic matter is associated with higher fertility, higher water holding capacity, uh, soil stability. Organic matter is sticky and it helps hold soil together to resist erosion. Um, and all of those things contribute to sustainability and productivity. So this is not a hard sell um, to, get, to get farmers and ranchers and land managers, uh, foresters, to want to increase the organic matter content of soils. So we were interested in whether or not uh, this could make a difference. And so the first question that we wanted to ask was, can soil carbon sequestration make a difference for global temperature? Um, we knew that there was evidence in the literature already that you could increase the organic matter content and the soil carbon content um, in a variety of ecosystems, but we didn't know if you could do it at a scale uh, based on literature data that would actually make a difference for climate change mitigation. And so we undertook a really um, interesting, fun project. Um, this is my graduate student, Allegra Mayer, who's a biogeochemist like me, and we collaborated with a graduate student and a scientist from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, Zeke Housefather and, and um, Andy Jones, who are global modelers. And we said, well, how much carbon would you have to remove from the atmosphere to have a detectable effect on temperature? And we had to figure out what a detectable effect of temperature, on temperature would be from a carbon perspective. And I talked to a couple of my um, Earth, Earth system modeling friends. Earth systems models is the new name for global circulation models. Um, they're a little bit more comprehensive. And they're the ones that predict uh, what future climates are going to be. So I said, well, what, what would it take um, to have a detectable effect on temperature? And they said, well, about 0.1 degrees Celsius. So that's not very much, you think, but think about it this way. If you were trying to limit warming uh, on our planet to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and we've already warmed uh, one degree, then that's lowering the temperature or taking out enough carbon to lower the temperature 0.1 degrees C would get you 20% of the way to, to, to capping us at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if, if, if we can't make it to 1.5 and we're going to do two, well then you're 10% of the way there by removing um, enough carbon from the atmosphere to have a 0.1 degrees Celsius impact, right? So it actually turns out to be fairly significant. Um, when we modeled this, uh, we needed to consider emissions, right? It's not just about carbon dioxide removal. You have to couple this with emissions reduction. And the climate change community uses these scenarios that have been developed through these Earth systems models um, that predict uh, the effects of future CO2 emissions on global temperatures. And they use different assumptions. And there are four uh, scenarios, they're called representative concentration pathways, RCPs, that are, have been adopted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, as the ones that everybody should use as their general targets. And so here's what they are. This red line is RCP 8.5. That's the business as usual uh, type scenario. So that says we're just going to continue to emit, and this is what's going to happen to CO2. I mean, that's pretty scary. Uh, that's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, and that's going to affect warming. Uh, the second one is the orange one. That's 6.0, and that just shows some emissions reduction and what the warming there is. That's also pretty scary. Uh, then you get to purple, and that's RCP 4.5. That's the RCP that the state of California is using for their uh, climate change uh, um, planning, uh, climate change mitigation planning, and for their uh, legislation. And what 4.5 does is it uh, increases the amount of, uh, of emissions reduction over time. Uh, we have uh, this landmark legislation called AB 32, which um, said that we had to lower uh, our CO2 emissions by uh, in in 2020 to below 1990 levels. And by the way, we're, we've made that. We're going to exceed that. But now we have to reduce it 80% more by 2050. So really severe um, emissions reduction. None of these scenarios, by the way, include 
carbon dioxide removal yet. So if you add carbon dioxide removal on top of this, you're going to do better. But what you see with California's scenario in this purple one, 4.5, you see an increase to over 550 parts per million, so a really significant increase, and then it begins to level off. At this point, we're talking about almost all solar, wind, and hydro hydrothermal for energy. So it really is uh, dramatically reducing emissions. And then there's this green scenario, which is the one that we all used to uh, talk a lot about. That's 2.6. That's the most uh, aggressive emissions reduction scenario. Uh, while we still talk about this, um, many um, policymakers and so some scientists think it's probably unattainable, especially given the pr current political climate. But this is the one that, uh, that um, limits uh, CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere to only 450 ppm and then begins to decline a little bit. So those are the RCPs. Um, and that's important because we, 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 had to, we had to couple our CO2 removal from the atmosphere with um, an estimate of uh, background emissions reduction, uh, background emissions and emission reduction. So how much carbon would we have to remove from the atmosphere to lower the global temperature by 0.1 degrees C? Well, using RCP 2.6, the most optimistic scenario, we would only have to remove 0.68 gigatons of carbon per year to lower global temperature by 0.1 degrees C in the year 2100, okay? So, and you say 0.68, well, that, gigatons. Gigatons is a lot, it's 10, you know, 10 to the 15th grams, but that was actually a much lower number than I expected. Um, however, it's very dependent upon emission scenarios. So if we look at the 8.5 scenario right here, uh, we actually have to remove almost twice as much, 1.25 gigatons per year, to have the same effect, right? So it, just to, to reiterate that there's this virtuous cycle that if you want to do carbon dioxide removal, it's best to kind of couple that with a, a aggressive emissions reduction or you're not going to reach your target, right? So this tells us that kind of the range of carbon we need to remove to have a detectable impact on global temperatures. How much carbon? Uh, do people think that we can remove in working landscapes? And this is strictly agricultural. So we, there had already been some work done on forestry. We decided we would tackle uh, crop agriculture and grazing lands. And this is what we found. What we did was we reviewed, um, we pulled together all the data that had done global scale reviews, looking at the available land area and the practices that had already been well vetted to sequester carbon. So this is changes in um, land use practices that had shown in multiple studies to increase soil carbon stocks. Um, biochar, improved land management on croplands, which include cover crops, uh, reduced tillage, uh, changes in fertilizer management, changes in water management, and then improved management on rangelands, which um, in, in included um, uh, grazing management um, and also uh, changes in um, uh, species composition. Um, those were the things that had been studied at a global scale. There's some other potential approaches, but these are the only ones that had been studied at a global scale by multiple authors, and so that was the data we used. And what we came up with was this combined potential of 1.3 to 2.9 um, uh, petagram or uh, gigatons of, of carbon per year that could technically, theoretically, technically, uh, be removed from the atmosphere. If these improved practices were applied at a global scale to the existing land area that are, being, that, that are available for those practices. And that's really important too. One of the things that we had to go through as we were uh, publishing this paper was to make, the, make it clear that we weren't talking about putting new land under cultivation and we weren't touching BEX, bioenergy, at all. So assuming that the land that had already been allocated for bioenergy crops stayed in bioenergy crops, we did not include that land in our analysis. We only included land that was in crop agriculture, that was non-energy crops, or grazing land. And then we, we looked at the average, which is about two. So the average is about two gigatons of carbon per year could be removed with known technologies that are already um, being applied. And so what does that do? Well, if we removed two gigatons of carbon per year um, at a global scale through these practices, we could 
theoretically lower global temperatures by 0.3 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. So much, much more um, than uh, what, what we thought we would be able to achieve at a global scale through agriculture. Um, and we separated this out between the combined potential, which is up here, and the combined potential without biochar. Without biochar, uh, we would reach the 0.1 degree C. With biochar, uh, we would uh, reach 0.3 degrees C. And this is because the biochar research, even though it has been reviewed at a global scale, is somewhat controversial. Um, and, and, and part of the problem is, is that biochar it is a very diverse material with very diverse properties. Um, and um, it, you know, the, the range of effects that biochar can have is, is, is equally huge and diverse. And so we felt it was really important to separate out those effects. But if, if biochar turns out to be as good as people think biochar is, then there's significant potential. And so what this told us was, wow, okay, maybe we should, maybe we should really look into this. There is significant potential not only to, to affect global temperatures um, by removing carbon from, uh, from the atmosphere, we, we could potentially make it have an impact um, by managing lands uh, better uh, for carbon sequestration. So that was looking at the existing practices that we knew already about at a global scale. We, were, we wondered if there were anything, any other strategies that could be explored, any low-hanging fruit uh, per se that could do it better, faster, and cheaper. And we've been looking at soil amendments as a way to do that. And so the three soil amendments that my group is um, working on are uh, composted organic matter, and we've done a global analysis of that. Um, the local potential has been um, well, fairly well documented. My group and a few other groups have been working on this. Um, the global potential of direct capture through this uh, process, in other words, the carbon that would be actually sequestered in the ground, is about 0.5 uh, gigatons of uh, carbon per year. Um, the indirect effects are unquantified at a global scale, but greatly exceed um, the, eff the effects of direct sequestration. And that's because the stuff that gets composted is being pulled out of high emitting waste streams. And so you get this added benefit of taking things like organic matter, food waste, and green waste out of landfills, manure waste out of slurry ponds, places like that, um, that, are, that are very high emitting you remove the, the waste from that material and thus get lower emissions. Um, biochar, uh, we're starting to look at biochar. Uh, again, the local potential has been documented. The global potential is estimated to be about one gigaton of carbon um, annually, and um, the indirect effects are unquantified. And those indirect effects are things like how much carbon are you emitting by making the biochar? Is it a waste product that it, um, that is, um, uh, being produced in a way that captures any emissions that are coming off of it. Um, how is that biochar produced? That's kind of important. And then the third one is, is quite controversial. Uh, we're looking at ground rock. Uh, we're just starting this research. We just got our, our first shipment of ground rock delivered to our field site. Um, and this is really testing the idea that um, you can enhance weathering, geologic weathering, by applying ground rock to agricultural fields. It's quite controversial. But as rock weathers, it, um, it absorbs CO2 um, and produces carbonates. It's a natural process. It usually happens over geologic time scales. But uh, you can make it happen over ecological time scales by grinding the rock into very small bits. And it turns out that there's a lot of waste rock that's being produced uh, through a variety of industrial activities that uh, needs a use. Um, and uh, ranchers and farmers, mostly farmers, have been applying rock to their fields uh, for, for the last few decades as a mineral supplement um, to their fields and also to reverse some of the effects of compaction. And so we thought, oh, this would be interesting to look at. Uh, it's poorly quantified. Uh, the back of the envelope estimates are about 0.5 gigatons of carbon direct and indirect capture potential annually. So that's what we're looking at today. I want to talk about our long-term data, which is on compost. So we wanted to look at compost amendments, again, thinking that there were high emitting waste streams, we could capture that waste, take it out of the high emitting waste streams, compost it, and land apply it. Um, and we thought we would land apply it to grasslands. And again, this is an ecologist thinking about this. It turned out that once we got well into this, um, the state 
uh, some of the people in the state, especially our, our food and agriculture uh, division at the state, uh, got kind of angry with us and said, why are you not looking at croplands? And I explained the following. The reason I'm not looking at croplands is because grasslands tend to occur in places where there's water deficit at least part of the year. And when you live in a place with a water deficit in a natural ecosystem, uh, plants tend to allocate some of their photosynthate, maybe more of their photosynthate, below ground to roots, right, looking for water um, than above ground tissues. And any time you increase the allocation below ground to roots, you're effect effectively injecting carbon into soils. And some of that carbon gets trapped, either in aggregates or gets shunted down deep enough that microbial activity is low, or maybe it finds itself into an, in an anaerobic pocket where microbial activity is low, and that carbon can be stored. And if you look at the carbon content of healthy grasslands um, throughout many places in the globe, these tend to be very carbon-rich soil environments, right? So that made sense. We'll, we'll work on grasslands. Um, grasslands are geographically expansive. They cover about 30% of the global land surface. They are the dominant land use type globally. Uh, they cover about 30% of the U.S. land area. And in California, they cover about 40% of the land area, 23 million hectares. So it was convenient for me being at Berkeley to be able to work out my back door instead of flying down to Puerto Rico, uh, whereas I do the rest of my research. So it was, it was a good place to, to do that research. And then finally, land use has resulted in significant carbon losses from grassland soils globally over the last 12,000 years. And this is a really, comes from a really cool paper that a colleague of mine, John Sanderman, wrote um, and with, with his colleagues um, back in 2017, where they modeled back and projected how much carbon had been lost during, um, during human um, development, human development of agriculture. And what they found here in green is that grazing lands have lost a lot of carbon over time. And so the theory is, you know, carbon lost means that these ecosystems are partially empty with regard to carbon, and maybe we can figure out a way to fill them back up. And how best to fill them back up but add carbon to the surface, right? I mean, this is kind of, this is not deep science. It's not rocket science. But, you know, we have this waste carbon that's around. Why don't we just add it back to soils and see if the soils will take it up and increase the carbon content? Well, the way that most ranchers, people who manage grasslands, add carbon to soils is primarily through cattle manure. Um, and that's uh, because uh, in the dairy industry and now also in the beef cattle industry where people congregate cows, they produce a lot of a manure that needs, they need to get rid of. And the best way to get rid of it is to put it in a truck, usually in slurry form, so it's been sitting in a big pond that goes anaerobic and creates just impressive amounts of methane. Um, and then you put it in a truck and you spray it out on the fields where it produces an impressive amount of nitrous oxide. Those are two very potent greenhouse gases. So methane um, is about, oh, I think 34 times as potent per molecule as CO2 on a 100-year time frame. And nitrous oxide is 298 times more potent than um, CO2 on a 100-year time frame. So very potent greenhouse gases. We don't want to emit more of those greenhouse gases. Just to illustrate, manure management, which includes the slurries and the ponding and even land application, is equivalent to coal mining for methane emissions and equivalent to mobile combustion or tailpipe emissions for nitrous oxide. It, it doesn't get talked about a lot. But manure management is a huge source of greenhouse gas. So adding manure directly to fields, piling it up, storing it in slurry ponds, and adding it to fields didn't seem like a good idea if you were trying to mitigate climate change. So we wondered if you could keep that manure out of the slurry ponds and, and the, the manure piles, but compost it with some high cellulose, low nutrient material that would force the microbes to decompose the material more slowly hopefully lowering the greenhouse gas emissions, and then create a recalcitrant material, a material that would be hard to decay further, that we could spread out on the field and would last a long time, and thus help that carbon get trapped in the soil and stored for longer, longer periods, help mitigate climate change. So the theory here is managed decomposition. What we're aiming for is cellulose, larger pieces of things like wood chips or straw that are hard for my microbes to break down anyway, and then microbial bodies. With the idea that 
microbes can decay material that's stoichiometrically favorable for them. But they reach a point where the stoichiometry, particularly the carbon to nitrogen ratio, ceases to be favorable for them, and they can't digest that material. And you can really see this beautifully in action. We study these things, Newt and I study these things in, in terrestrial ecosystems all the time, um, but not, in, not, not in, in a way where we can so, so nicely manage decomposition. But this is managed decomposition. So what we see when we put that fresh material in a compost pile is it begins to decay, CO2 fluxes increase. If the oxygen is consumed, which it generally is during a, a composting process, at least for short periods of time, you may get methane emissions, so you do get some methane emissions from this. The microbes continue to break the material down. It goes through essentially a succession of microbial processes where one group eats the, the stuff that's easily degradable, and then the next group of microbes eats those microbes and the stuff that's a little harder to degrade, and the temperature goes up and up and up and up and up until you reach a point where they can't break it down anymore and the temperature plummets back to atmospheric temperatures and it's done. The material can sit there now for weeks, months, years, and it doesn't, it doesn't change very much. De they've reached the point where that material now is too hard for the microbial communities to break down quickly. It will break down eventually, but not quickly, and that's when the compost is ready. And that takes, in a, this controlled environment, takes somewhere between eight and 11 weeks, right? So it's not, it's not too onus, uh, you know, it's not too, too hard a process. Um, well, how long will that compost likely to last based on what we know about the chemical composition of compost? And what's interesting is unlike biochar, compost is a lot less diverse because it looks like the composition of the microbial bodies for the most part when you're done. If it's finished compost, it's going to converge on a relatively narrow range of CN ratios. And I know this because I went around and sampled compost from many, many compost facilities looking for a wide range of CN ratios to test some basic ecological theory. And I couldn't find it, and I couldn't find it, and I was getting frustrated. Why can't I find this with all these different materials and these different producers? And then I finally realized, oh, well, if it's finished compost, it's going to have to be within this range of CN ratio. Otherwise, it, it's not finished compost. So we wanted to know what the potential long-term impacts of this were, and we used a modeling approach to start with that. Uh, we used the Descent uh, biogeochemical model. I won't go through all the details of the model. Uh, suffice it to know that it, it's, a, it's a good model and it can give us, um, you know, an estimate of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the landscape as well as uh, carbon being shunted into plants and soils um, and, and various pools. Okay, this is what the results showed. The model, um, and let me explain this graph. So this is the relative change in carbon from a, a, a fields that would have received compost relative to a control field where they didn't. So anything above the line is a carbon gain in the fields that receive compost. That's not a big surprise. Again, you're adding, you're adding carbon to the ecosystem. What we did here was something that I thought was pretty clever. We, um, we had to figure out a way in the model to differentiate the carbon we added from, as compost from the carbon that would have normally been in the soil. And what we did was we told the model, we lied to the model. I'm sorry, I admit it. But we lied to the model and we told the model that the compost had a distinct C14 signature. And the model could then uh, differentiate the carbon that had the distinct C4, C14 signature with the chemical composition of the compost that we know it ex exists. We let the model then de decompose the compost over time. It decomposes very slowly. What we saw was a rapid increase in ecosystem carbon between about 5 and 10 metric tons of carbon per hectare. And that was maintained for most of the century from a one-time application of a, about a half-inch compost onto rangelands. So we saw that and we thought, well, that's really cool. Um, we don't believe it, but, it, but it's really cool. Um, I mean, this is a model, and models are only as good as, as um, the, the input variables and, the, and the, your understanding of, of ecosystems. And we thought this was intriguing, but we, we didn't know if it was real. Uh, so we wanted to compare it with, with field data. So in 2008, we added uh, compost in a thin layer. Again, we were aiming for about a, a half inch. Now we're down to a quarter inch. We're getting much better at this. And the reason we want to use a small amount is we want that material to go as far as possible, and we also want it to be as cheap as possible 
for uh, producers because if it's too expensive, they won't, they won't pay for it. And then we proceeded to sample soil carbon, uh, nitrogen, greenhouse gas dynamics, uh, vegetation uh, for several years. And we've now just completed a decade of research. So we sampled from 2008, which was our pretreatment, to 2013. We sampled annually, uh, some cases multi uh, multi-times uh, during the, the year, and then we came back in 2018 for our 10-year resurvey. And this is what the surface soils look like. So this is 2008, this is uh, pretreatment, and uh, there was no statistically significant difference between treatment and control, um, and then uh, compost is added, this is in the 0 to 10 centimeter depth here, and um, we saw, uh, and this is real data, the red bars here are compost, the blue are the control. We saw a significant increase in soil carbon content um, in the, the compost amended plots relative to the control. And what was really exciting was in 2018, we still see a, a big significant difference between the treatment plots and the controls. And before you say, well, of course you see that because you added carbon to the soils, um, you should know that there's an army of undergraduates that sit in my lab and they get free cookies and uh, good music and comfortable chairs and they sit there with tweezers and they pick out any recognizable organic matter ever, out of every single soil sample, which is thousands of soil samples that we, we process. So any fragment of soil organic matter comes out before we analyze those samples. So this is rep representing just the carbon that is no longer recognizable as a fragment. Right? So it's, it's, it's carbon that's been incorporated into soil organic matter. So that's the surface soils. What was really exciting in this 10-year resurvey that we just recently finished was that we're starting to see the carbon move into subsoils. So this is now a change plot, a relative change. Anything above the line is a gain. Anything below the line is a, technically a loss. This is the 0 to 10 in gray that I just showed you. This is the, the 10 to 30 centimeter depth. And I, I talk about subsoil as 10 to 30 because these grasslands are relatively shallow. Uh, we do have some places where we can sam sample down to a meter, but in many cases, the parent material is at about 30 centimeters depth. Um, what this shows us is prior to um, the compost being added, it turned out that our, our treatment plots, pre-treatment, had significantly lower carbon at this depth than the controls. So we're starting off at, with this as our baseline. And then, and we, we missed our uh, depth sample from 2009. Um, in 2010 through 13, you can see that, while it looks like we might be increasing a little bit, the variability is still pretty high, even up to 2013. And then we get to 2018, and we're starting to see a shift. So five years later, we're starting to see what looks like carbon accumulation in the subsoil. That was a statistically significant increase. Um, and when we look at that together, the 0 to 30 centimeter depth, we see a gain, a significant gain of 8.8 .8 plus or minus 1.7 metric tons of carbon per hectare over that 10 years, averaging somewhere about a metric ton of carbon per hectare per year, which is what we had predicted, and is well within the range of the model prediction. This is from a one-time surface application of a dusting in, in 2008. So that was exciting. Um, a lot of that carbon is being added as uh, new organic matter, so it's new carbon being pulled out of the atmosphere, and we know this because of biomass change. So this is above ground biomass in the compost plots relative to the controls. The first uh, three years of the study, this is all post-treatment now, the first three years of the study we saw these huge increases in biomass, and then California was in a severe drought, and total biomass just plummeted, and uh, we don't see much of a difference. But in 2018, we're still seeing what looks like a little bit of a bump um, in biomass. And again, that was a statistically significant result. OK. Um, this was really exciting for us um, to, 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 to be able to detect these kinds of changes and see these patterns. Um, the state of California was interested in seeing if they could incorporate this into their climate action planning. That was a kind of a nerve-wracking thing for a, a biologist, ecologist, biogeochemist, um, something I, I hadn't ever interacted with policymakers before. Um, but uh, when, Calif when California decided to do their fourth uh, climate assessment over the last couple of years, we were invited to participate in that. That's significant uh, because while forests were included in climate action planning in California from the very beginning, 
uh, from their first assessment. Rangelands, the word rangelands had not appeared in their climate action planning, even though rangelands cover 40% of the land area until this report, right? So they hadn't been considering that, and it was primarily due, due to lack of published data. Uh, so we got invited to participate. They wanted us to do research at the state level, so we got a grant to add compost um, in collaboration with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which was interested in doing field trials to see if this was a practice they could include in their uh, equip grants, their funding to, to farmers and ranchers. So we found 15 sites across California where we did paired plots of uh, compost and control. Uh, we've been following that. This is the first set of data to come out of that. The, the average sequestration rates are a little higher than we saw in our initial study, about two metric tons of carbon. Uh, per hectare per year. I don't know if that's going to hold up over time, but we'll follow that. And then we took seven of these sites and we used the day scent model to project into the future. And um, with the day scent model, what we asked are what are the local to regional effects of compost amendments on ecosystem carbon dynamics? Does soil carbon persist over the long term at a regional scale? And this, is, this was a new piece that we added. What are the climate change effects on long term soil carbon dynamics? Is soil carbon sequestration resistant to climate change? And if not, that's something that we need to know. So if we're going to lose more carbon from ecosystems when the, when the ecosystem gets warmer uh, and wetter or warmer or drier, we need to know. Uh, we took those seven sites. We used a control scenario and a single compost addition now looking at a quarter inch of compost. Uh, we used two uh, Earth systems models that come up with different future climate projections, and we downloaded the data from those model runs. We used the Hadley model and the Canadian Earth Systems model, and we used the California chosen RCP 4.5, and then the business as usual scenario as a comparison. Um, the two Earth Systems models differ. They both they both give us a warmer world, but they differ uh, significantly in precipitation uh, predictions. So the Canadian Earth Systems model shows a wetter California in general, and the, the um, Hadley model shows a generally drier California with uh, quite a bit of variation. Not a lot of difference between the two uh, scenarios for future precipitation in Hadley. Uh, significant differences uh, for the Canadian model. And when we look at the future climate, uh, future uh, precipitation for the, all the sites that we measured over uh, each decade, so this is decadal data, decadally averaged data uh, to the end of the century, what we found that our, our wetter sites, Mendocino and um, the, the kind of uh, Sonoma and, or Solano and Marin areas, um, sh show a disproportionate drying relative to the others um, in the, the Canadian model. So there was definitely a significant uh, prediction, significantly different predictions. This is important for rangelands and, and grassland systems in general because they're so sensitive. Productivity is so sensitive uh, to precipitation, as you saw from the data I just presented. Okay, so what does a single um, compost application uh, do uh, to these grasslands over time, given all these different scenarios? This is the relative change in, in net primary productivity. Remember, it's, it's uh, compost minus control, so anything above the line means a gain. No big surprise. You add carbon and nutrients. You get an increase in um, an above ground net primary productivity, plant growth, at all the sites. Um, and what was interesting is that that was sustained also at all the sites uh, for most of the record. Um, it starts to get down towards zero towards the end of the record. And what was also surprising was that MPP appeared to be uh, resistant to the climate change scenarios and climate models. So we saw very few differences in the compost amended sites. We see some differences in our control sites, but very few differences in the compost amended sites. So the model is telling us that adding compost is actually maybe a good cli climate adaptation strategy in addition to a climate mitigation strategy. Similar types of results for soil carbon. So this is the relative soil organic carbon here on this axis. This shows the increase. You get the biggest bang for your buck in the first 15 years. Then the gain in carbon starts to decline, uh, but you don't even get down to baseline after um, 85 years. And what's really interesting here is I want to draw your attention to Santa Barbara, 
which is purple. Santa Barbara is one of our drier sites. Um, it's towards the southern part of the state, but um, it had quite a robust response, and our field data are backing that up. Um, so it suggests that this might work for both wet ecosystems and dry ecosystems. San Diego is also a, a dry site, and it's towards the bottom uh, here, but uh, still showing a similar pattern as the wetter sites. Okay. And then finally, we were interested in whether or not nitrous oxide fluxes from uh, adding compost amendments could potentially um, limit the overall uh, global warming potential gain. So in other words, the, the mitigation gain of this practice. Um, our field and lab research has suggested that compost really doesn't produce a lot of nitrous oxide. Remember, it's pretty far along in the decomposition process, so there's not a lot of available nitrogen. But it does decay and it does mineralize. Uh, what we found, surprisingly, the model, which actually tends to overestimate nitrous oxide fluxes, found no statistically significant differences between the treatments and the controls. So in this case, we're plotting uh, the, the uh, treatment and control plots uh, with the two scenarios at all the sites, and it's just kind of a jumble. Um, they are responding to climate, but they're not responding to compost. Okay. I just want to finish up by by um, talking about the bigger picture. You know, I tend to focus, uh, as an ecologist and a biogeochemist, on soils and plants and atmospheres in, in given sites. But when you're talking about climate change mitigation, you have to look uh, beyond uh, the ecosystem itself and look at upstream and downstream uh, emissions. And so we do this with life cycle assessment modeling, where we try to uh, consider as much as we can in the life cycle of that material from food waste or uh, uh, livestock waste or green waste to composting. So we've been measuring compost emissions, uh, transportation ecosystem impact, which we measure directly, the avoidable emissions, and come up with a net global warming potential. Um, we focused on manure waste and, um, and food waste, uh, food waste in particular, uh, because it ends up in landfills, and that's uh, one of the largest sources of methane um, emissions in the U.S. And we've made direct measurements of composting, which is the, the part of the life cycle assessment model that's the most poorly quantified. Happy to talk to people about that later. We're using an eddy covariance type approach. This is what it looks like with towers and lots of sensors. And it's a, a, a gear hound like me. It's, my, it's, it's, it's like heaven. Controlled decomposition with lots of instruments. It's super fun. Um, so uh, this is what we found um, when we looked at the um, uh, life cycle assessment of the practice. Um, we see some direct emissions, um, um, primarily in the form of uh, methane, and they're pretty significant. Uh, they're greater for food waste composting than other forms of composting, but composting is not carbon neutral. Don't believe anybody who tells you that it is. Um, but if you look at the avoided emissions from manure or landfill management, you get a, a significant savings there. You add in the soil carbon sequestration, and we see a net uh, negative, so in other words, a drawdown of carbon from the atmosphere. So this suggests that this is, on a larger, from a larger perspective, a, a carbon beneficial or climate beneficial practice. So just to, just to summarize the take home, greenhouse gas emissions reduction is essential, but not sufficient uh, to solve climate change. Uh, you have to have carbon dioxide removal. We have to be, be working on these practices. Uh, soils won't solve the problem alone. They just won't. They're not going to sequester at a high enough rate um, uh, everywhere. But they certainly can contribute to a portfolio of solutions. And, and, and at least with compost amendments and maybe even other amendments, uh, there's no reason not to do this, because this is good for farming and food production. Uh, waste to compost to soils is an example of a viable strategy for greenhouse gas emissions reduction and carbon dioxide removal with co-benefits. Uh, that makes it more economically feasible. We're now doing an economic analysis uh, with a new student and trying to understand that she's really an economist, so, so I'm not trying to do that myself. And the, oops, go back. Finally, ecology, biology, and biogeochemistry have a big role to play in rigorously testing proposed solutions for mitigation and adaptation. And I really think that we, more of us need to step up and do this kind of research. Otherwise, people who are not doing the science are getting to make the, making decisions based on on um, hearsay, and so please go out and make more measurements. And I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention.
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the manure that's sourced into the compost experiments that we're doing come from two major sources. Um, one of them is the manure solids that get scooped out of these slurry ponds. Um, and that's relevant because there are, um, there's a move to try to uh, build anaerobic digesters um, for manure management that would create uh, methane and methanol as a fuel source uh, via anaerobic, anaerobic decomposition. But they, are, they can't handle all the solids. So that solids could be separated, you know, even before it ends up in a slurry pond, um, could be separated out and, and, and used in composting facilities. Or the digestate could be used in composting facilities. All of those things would help limit that runoff. And then the other place where we're getting it is, is um, trying to keep it out of manure slurries and, and, and piles by having dairies uh, collect it directly, uh, stick it in a truck, and uh, either truck it to a compost facility or build their own compost pads. So the kind of exciting thing is California has now um, given ranchers incentives to do this. They're trying to remove some of the regulatory hurdles, uh, which are, again, not based on data thus far. So they're based on, and I'm, we're working with the Air Resources Board on this and the Water Resources Board as well. They made regulations based on their best guess, but are first, the first to admit that there's no data to back that up, especially with composting. So, so that, to capture that material before it goes into these other waste streams and have it be composted directly on site with green waste, um, straw in the case of um, dairies. And in California, there's a lot of surrounding agriculture and wood waste that needs a home, and so these are good places to do that. So yeah, the idea is, and we've, we've been trying to convince the water board that we actually get um, net nitrate immobilization in these piles. We're not producing any nitrate that's coming out of the piles. Um, and we've, we measure uh, net nitrification and, and mineralization weekly in these compost piles, and we've not yet produced very much at all. So it's definitely probably not a source of um, nitrate and probably not a big source of nitrous oxide. Other question? Uh, Jerry. Could you comment on the application of these methods to arid land restoration? Uh, I notice in your maps that you show big areas of Western U.S. and other parts of the world as uh, non-grasslands, yeah. but prior, well, two centuries ago, they were short grass grasslands, and if they could be brought back into the system, there would be a significant increase in sequestration. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, we focused right now, uh, we focused on existing grasslands uh, to be conservative. Um, and, and I was concerned that um, I, I was concerned we wouldn't see a, a, a big effect. That that the um, dry, you know we we don't have arid systems in California. We only get to semi-arid, med really Mediterranean, but on the edge of semi-arid. And so um, we wanted to test compost applications in those regions. But my hypothesis was that the systems would be more water limited than uh, than nutrient limited. And not that we're adding a lot of super labile nutrients right away with compost, but there is a slow release. It's like a slow release fertilizer. So I was, I was concerned that we wouldn't see a big effect. Um, I also probably underestimated the increase in water holding capacity, which has since been measured and modeled by a group of people from the USGS, which turns out to be very significant. And so we do see big effects in the drier ends of our gradient, much bigger than we expected. Um, on, the feet, on the ground, not just in the model, but on the ground, we're seeing a, a, a big effect. And so that, you know, that suggests to me that there is definitely potential. Um, one of the things you have to be careful about when you, when you increase the organic matter content and nutrient content of grassland systems or uh, degraded grassland systems is, is invasion of non-native species. And it's been something that we've been very concerned about so far in the systems that we've studied, we've not seen an increase in, in noxious invasive weeds, uh, but we've, we've only worked on, you know, 
<laughs> we think of them as dry because I do a lot of work in tropical forests, but they're, they're on the, you know, they're, they're on the more Mediterranean side as opposed to semi-arid with regard to the rainfall regimes. Um, so I think that's something that would need to be looked at uh, in drier systems. Um, and then there's a group in Boulder, Colorado that's looking at compost for, for rehabilitation of severely degraded um, sites and rangeland there. That'll be really interesting because they're so degraded that there's no plants, um, no visible plants anyway. So they're going to have to use compost and then seed and see what kind of impact it has. So I think it is a good point. Um, certainly organic matter, loss of organic matter is, is one of the factors that leads to severe degradation. And if you can reverse that with increasing soil organic matter content, that would be, that would be awesome as long as it doesn't come at too big a cost, uh, either financially or from a biodiversity perspective. Maybe one more question. We, uh, we use a lot of energy trying to convert human sewage into socially acceptable uh, um, pro um, products. I wonder whether your argument um, provides a basis for a different kind of treatment of human sewage. Absolutely. In fact, the, the graduate student who worked with me on the early phases of this project, Rebecca Riles, you probably saw her name on, on some of the slides, she um, went on to do a postdoc, on the, uh, she went on to do a, a postdoc in the Chesapeake Bay where they were concerned about sewage effluent um, into ecosystems and then went from there, got a grant to work in Haiti where they have a real problem with waste disposal. Um, and she's working with a group called Soil that is putting compo composting toilets all over Haiti um, and then taking that, that um, composted material and applying it to landscapes to try to re rehabilitate severely de degraded lands. Not arid lands, but very highly eroded, uh, degraded lands. And um, sh she's brought in various collaborators um, over time, including um, microbiologists from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab that showed that that composted human waste in Haiti was uh, free of uh, identifiable pathogens and um, you know, biogeochemically fairly safe. And so now she's, she has a position at UC Merced as a faculty member, and they're looking at biosolids, uh, w which include human waste biosolids, composting those and land applying them. The problem right now is, is that you can't apply that to systems where you're growing food. Um, I think that that may change as people begin to realize that there's no negative, um, if, it's, if it's composted well, there shouldn't be a negative impact. Um, I have a colleague that's looking at pharmaceuticals in composted human waste as well as um, other uh, landfill waste and shows that when you compost it, you're breaking down all the major uh, uh, concerns uh, from the pharmaceuticals. So these microbes are, are pretty good at what they do. Um, I, I think it's probably in our future um, that we will be able to do that. Um, it'll be a hard sell to our farmers. and. Uh, the, the ranchers were fine. They'll take anything. Um, uh, the farmers want the only, what they consider the highest quality compost. And now we're getting into a situation in California where there's going to be this big competition between farmers and ranchers and who gets it. Because rancher, farm, farmers want to overapply. They want to apply it every year. And they're, they're not willing to let go of that as a fertilization, right? And, and even though they probably don't need it, they're unwilling to let go of it. And so there's this competition. Is we, th we thought before that that um, we would never be able to, to utilize all the organic waste um, produced in California. And now we're finding that there may not be orga enough organic waste produced in California to meet everybody's needs. So it's, it's no longer a waste. It's now an important product. Thank you, Thank you Wendy. Um, I just have a couple of, of things. If I could take the liberty of making a comment. Sure. Um, Catherine may want to say something, too. C Catherine and I both lobbied to bring you here. And, so thanks for coming. Um, the, one of the points you made was uh, several times actually was that, well, California had these regulations, but they were just sort of guesses. And you know, working with pu um, policy advocates and lawyers, actually, I've learned that you know the, there are challenges to regulations, and we live in a world now, a political world, where regulations are challenged and discounted. It's really this kind of work is really important 
uh, even in a world where data is not believed or uh, taken seriously sometimes, it's still really important to have regulations that have data that inform them uh, because these regulations are in court. Um, I don't know if you have anything to follow up on that. But yeah, I would. That, just, I just, that's really important. One of the discussions we had um, at lunch, I hesitate to say this because it's politically incorrect, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that there's a lot of magic thinkers out there. Um, and there's a lot of people who get the, the ear of policymakers and the public that aren't doing science or good science. And, um, and it, it's the peer-reviewed data in reputable journals that moves this forward. Um, and, and, I'm, and the other thing I would say is that um, I'm, not a, I'm not an advocate. Um, I may advocate for science over no science, but I don't advocate for any of my results. And so I, hand, I will interpret those results for policymakers, but I make it a strict policy that if they tell me what to do, ask me what to do, I don't tell them. I said, that's for you to decide. I can answer questions about the science. Um, and, and the reason why is because I want the science to stand on its own, and I also want to retain the the opportunity to change my mind, right? I want, to, I want it to be all based on data. And I think that we, we need to train our policymakers to understand what science is good for and then utilize that science in the best ways possible. Uh, that's, that's my two cents on the topic. Well, thanks for your nickel. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth a nickel more than two cents. But, but um, I just have an opportunity for a couple of people um, Wendy and I are going out to dinner at 6 at Venology, and anyone who wants to carry this conversation forward, the first two uh, people who talk with me are welcome to go to dinner. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's free. I know graduate students are often, you know, free, you'll find me. But uh, we, we can carry this conversation further in a small group. So just let me know. Catherine, anything you'd like to say? I think you've covered everything. Okay. So let, join me in thanking uh, Wendy for making the trip. <laughs>